course, additional people will, will uh, come in. So welcome everybody to the last um, uh, seminar of the semester uh, with Jens Ludwig. I, I think you'll all agree that, that we saved the best for last um, uh, this year. Jens is the um, Edwin A. and Betty L. Bergman Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. Um, he's director of the Chicago's uh, Crime Lab and co-director of uh, Chicago's Education Lab. He's going to be presenting uh, work today on the impact of high dosage tutoring, which is um, Ex extremely ex um, timely, given that many districts are, are talking about tutoring as a as a, a way to try to help students catch up from the the COVID uh, pandemic. So, for those of you who who are new, I just want to uh, remind you of of, of if the ground rules. Um, so, we we just ask that you um, if you have a clarifying question during the seminar, please ask it. But if you've got a bigger uh, uh, picture kind of question, please hold it till the end of Jens's talk and then we can discuss it. Um, but if you do have a clarifying question during the presentation, either um, raise your hand or, uh, and I will call on you, or if you, um, if you, um, uh, if it seems like an opportune time, you could just try to just speak, unmute yourself and, and speak up. But once we get to the end of the presentation, I'll ask you to raise your hand and I'll just, I'll call on you one by one as we, as we yeah, uh, wrap up our discussion of Jens's results. Okay. All right. So uh, without further ado, Jens Ludwig. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Tom. Uh, thanks so much, Tom, for, for having me. I think you mean you kept the most, uh, the people with the most unpronounceable names for last. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to, to be here. I've um, known Tom since I, uh, I think I first met you back in the, either the 1990s or the 1890s in yeah. Washington. So, I can't remember which. Yeah. I was thinking it was like 1994. Yeah, it was 1994 when I was just starting at Georgetown and I think you were visiting Brookings. So um, yeah. it's really a pleasure to, to be here. I'm going to um, talk about some work that we've been working on for a long, long time with a big team of people. You can see the, the co-authors are really the, the brains of the operation. I'm just the pretty face that they trot out to present the results. Um, you know, this is done in partnership with the Chicago Public Schools and with um, a wonderful nonprofit called Saga Education. Uh, I, I, we started this maybe, you know, eight years ago or something like that. I wish that we could say that we were prescient and could see the interest in high dosage tutoring coming down the road, but I think it's more uh, dumb luck and accident than anything else. But um, if you sort of think about the motivation, um, behind this project at a, sort of a very high level. I think everybody on this call has seen different versions of this graph before, which is like the uh, widening earnings over time in um, earnings to people with different levels of schooling. So increased importance of schooling, not just for earnings, but for all sorts of other uh, aspects of well-being and life. And I'm sure everybody has seen different versions of this graph as well. Uh, you can measure graduation trends in different ways. You could extend this out a couple more years. Depending on how you do it, you can see some signs of rise, but it's clear that schooling has not been improving in nearly the, the way that the labor market returns to schooling have as well. And so lots of people have gotten increasingly concerned that schooling is not keeping up with the demands of, um, of modern life. And uh, you could also look at, uh, a uh, couple other sort of patterns in the education research literature that uh, people have been looking at and, and getting concerned about a specific part of the problem. And so here's a, a graph from a paper by um, Eric Hanishek and his colleagues that looks at trends in test scores over time. And uh, they're looking at people within adolescence. Uh, so not a huge um, 
very difference in age between like 14 and 17 year olds. But I think the, the pattern that you can clearly see in their data is um, less of a, a growth in test scores over time for older kids than for younger kids. And if that's the only data point that we have, there are different ways that you could sort of reconcile that. But, um, you know, you can also see this in um, the data that uh, like set public satisfaction surveys by parents of school age kids, uh, parents with younger kids in the school system look like they're much more satisfied with the schools than uh, parents with adolescents. And alongside this as well, there's also a very large program evaluation literature that uh, tends to be much more encouraging for the effects of uh, educational interventions for relatively younger kids than for relatively older kids. Okay, so that collection of data points all together has led lots of people to become increasingly worried that uh, there's something um, intrinsically difficult that the returns to human capital investments might be higher early in life than later, and that that might be due to something uh, intrinsic about the nature of human capital development or human development more generally. And so these are explanations like declining developmental plasticity as people age. Um, there was a very influential um, National Academy of Sciences report that came out in 2000 called Neurons to Neighborhoods that got lots of people focused on the idea that developmental plasticity declines with age. Uh, my co-author on this paper, Larry Steinberg, has done some writing showing that uh, developmental plasticity seems to tick up again in adolescence, but nonetheless, I think people have been very worried about brain plasticity. Plasticity is one reason why interventions don't seem to be as effective later in life. And then there are also theories about learning begets learning or dynamic complementaries in human capital investment that would also suggest that concentrating human capital investment early in life would be much more fruitful than, um, than later in life. And my colleague here at the University of Chicago, Jim Heckman, has a very famous curve that I think many people here have seen called, uh, I think, many people now call it the Heckman curve, where you have rate of return to investments in human capital on the y-axis and age on the x-axis. And uh, the claim is that there are uh, substantial declines over the life course in the returns to investing in, uh, in human capital. So that's sort of the stylized fact that um, has represented, at least in, in many circles for a long time, sort of conventional wisdom about the value of trying to intervene um, with, uh, with older kids. And, and I would say that, you know, when we talk to people in public school systems, they would say, you know, we'll never, we would never say something like this explicitly, but when you look at how public school systems have historically allocated Title I dollars across grades, you can see that the public schools are concentrating a relatively larger share of their Title I dollars earlier in the life stage than, uh, than later, not for reasons that the federal government demands, but at least implicitly school systems and sort of thought that's where they would do the most good. So the, the question that we're starting off with here that motivated us originally really was the question of um, whether adolescence really is too late. Is it really too late to substantially improve um, people's human capital once they reach adolescence? And the, the uh, hypoth there's a different hypothesis that I think that we came to um, ourselves working with the Chicago public school system, which is maybe we uh, maybe previous interventions have not had the encouraging results that we'd like for adolescents, not because of something necessarily intrinsic about uh, adolescence per se, but because we've been trying the wrong interventions um, to boost their human capital. And so, that, uh, and for us, I think we started to get a sense of what might be going wrong ourselves when we um, were spending time in classrooms here in the Chicago public schools out on the west and south sides of Chicago. And, you know, you walk into like a ninth grade algebra one classroom, and this is the sort of problem that ninth grade algebra one teachers are trying to teach kids. Um, and like, if you focus on that, uh, let's take that second problem there, you know, I would be sitting in the back. I, in fact, I think, you know, the, the example that sticks with me most vividly, I can remember sitting in the back of a CPS classroom and seeing a teacher trying to teach a, a problem like that. And uh, 
they call on a kid. I'm sitting in the back of the classroom. They call on a kid and they say, you know, can you come up and solve this problem? And the kid comes up to the board and clearly doesn't have any idea about where to start. And then the teacher would spot the kid the first step by moving the minus 10 to the right. And then uh, the, uh, the teacher says, can you take it from here? And the kid sort of stands at the board and still freezes. And then the teacher would spot the kid the next step in solving the problem by dividing both sides by three. And it was really striking and in many ways heartbreaking to see a ninth grade CPS kid uh, not be able to solve the problem from there. And, you know, we would see this over and over again, uh, ninth grade algebra one teachers trying to teach kids algebra and you could see kids sit, a bunch of the kids in the classroom were doing amazingly well. They were operating, you could see that they were operating at above grade level, but you could also see that there were kids in these ninth grade algebra one classrooms that were struggling with, you know, even very basic uh, math operations that, you know, you would learn in second or third or, or fourth grade normally. And uh, you realize that what a difficult job being a classroom teacher in the Chicago public schools is, and it's particularly difficult in secondary schooling um, because you know one of the things that we know from work by Liz Caskio and Doug Steger is we think that the, the variance in uh, student test scores, that is uh, student academic ability and needs, fans out as kids progress through school. So kids become more and more variable in what they can do and what, uh, what they, what, at what sort of level they need instruction pitched as they get older and older. And then there you are a ninth grade um, algebra one teacher trying to teach a classroom of 30 kids that vary in their math skills from ninth or 10th grade down to, you know, say third or fourth grade. It's an intrinsically difficult job. Um, and when you look at surveys of teachers, you could sort of see this when you look at surveys of teachers, what do they say is the hardest part of teaching? They say it's personalizing instruction and classroom management. And the surveys of teachers suggest that high school teachers in particularly, particular find those the two hardest things about, uh, about their job. Now, the usual way that we've tried to solve that problem in, in education policy uh, in some sense is to you know, either focus on getting better teachers or incentivize the teachers that we have more. That is, you know, it's like, here's a big rock, push it up the hill, and then, you know, try and find better rock up the hill pushers or incentivize them more to, um, to push the rock up the hill. And a different way that you can sort of think about solving this problem is if the task itself is really so intrinsically difficult, is there a way that we can get better outcomes by reimagining the task and simplifying the task, right? And, you know, in particular, sort of the launching point for this strand of work has been to recognize that the two things that teachers describe as being really difficult, personalizing instruction and classroom management are really, really hard in a classroom of 30, but trivially easy when you have extreme class size reduction down to like one-to-one, -one, right? And, you know, in, in many ways, that's like a pedagogical insight that we've known for a long time. Uh, if you look at like Oxford University, they've been teaching through tutorial, tutorials since the 1200s. And, uh, you know, we have uh, work in education that has shown us over and over again that tutoring is one of the most effective ways that you can teach anybody to do anything. So the, the, the problem to be solved here in, in many ways is not sort of pedagogical, it's economic. You know, in a world in which we had unlimited money, we would love to give absolutely every kid in our public school systems one-to-one -one tutoring all the time for every subject. The reason that we don't do that is not because we don't think that's the best way to deliver instruction. The reason that we don't do that is because it's cost prohibitive. And so, you know, that sort of the puzzle that we've been trying to, uh, to, to solve here is to sort of think about um, if you could deliver a sufficiently personalized educational intervention at large scale to teens, would you see more encouraging uh, evidence of human capital development than what we've seen in lots of the other things that we've tried before with teens? And so I think the, um, the real genius of the, let me just 
show you the the real genius of the intervention that we're going to uh, to show you the results of here is really to have uh, for Saga Education, our our nonprofit partner on this, to have really figured out a way to deliver high dosage, like very intensive personalized instruction to kids um, in a way that like Oxford style instruction at closer to CPS prices would be the way that I would describe the genius insight. And I think that the, 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 the real insight that led Saga to that, I think, is to, you know, if you think about what it takes to be an effective classroom teacher, we have all of these requirements for pedagogical training and, and uh, teacher education, teacher certification before you become a teacher. Even with all of that, we can see in the data that there are like really strong returns to on the job experience over the first, at least the first three or four years of teaching. Like there's just a lot of human capital that you need to have to do a halfway decent job as a classroom teacher. Um, but if we simplify the task enough, the Saga education hypothesis is if you simplify the task enough, you don't need, in some sense, we're substituting uh, a much simpler task for a lot of teaching specific skill on the part of the teachers. And so what Saga does is they recruit people either right out of college or uh, uh, mid-career switchers who are willing to do this for one year uh, at basically like a public service stipend of about $20,000 a year. Now, this would be disastrous if you were going to ask them to do classroom teaching for a year and then they go off to do their next thing. But the hypothesis is that people can be good as a tutor right out of the gate um, over this one year period because tutoring is so much easier to do than regular classroom teaching. And so what Saga can do is for a cost of something on the order of like three or $4,000, um, they can give kids uh, very high dosage tutoring. So two on one, two kids per tutor, uh, an hour a day, every day in school with frequent formative assessment and, you know, and tailoring what the kids are doing. And that is uh, split between some combination of talking to the teachers and seeing what the kids are doing in their regular math classes and, um, and uh, basically reinforcing basic skills, basic math skills that the kids haven't gotten in their regular classes, okay? Uh, or ha haven't gotten cumulatively over their, uh, their educational careers. So uh, the first uh, RCT that we did of, uh, of this intervention in the Chicago Public Schools, this is a map of Chicago. Um, this is the downtown area, of which is where most of you have probably visited to come for uh, 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 convention or whatever in Chicago, Hyde Park, where I am right now, the University of Chicago is like located right here. We've color-coded the map here, the darker the red, the higher the violence rate. If we did this by poverty or we did this by racial segregation, you would see exactly the same pattern. All of that is very strongly co-patterned in Chicago with disadvantage concentrated on the south and west sides of the city and our schools being disproportionately concentrated in those same communities. We worked with, uh, in the original RCT, we had a sample of 2,600 ninth and 10th grade students. These are, in the first experiment, they were all uh, male students. Um, we randomly assigned half of them to be offered high dosage tutoring. Um, the, the, the way that we did this is uh, we did the randomization using administrative data over the summer, uh, using our best guess for who was going to be in what high school for the next year to draw the sample frame. Uh, about half of the kids that we randomized into treatment wind up in treatment. Most of the, the, the wedge between who's randomized and who complies is caused by kids we thought would show up in this school not showing up. So there's a huge amount of melt between the kids, between our forecast about who's going to go to that school the next year and who actually does show up. Among the kids who show up on the first day of school and have tutoring baked into their schedule, very few kids wind up actively opting out. Okay, so that gives you some sense for what's driving the, the non-compliance in the experiment. The other thing that I would quickly say about, uh, about the experimental setup here is for ninth grade, most of the ninth graders in, in our study sample, um, the default was 
uh, what CPS calls double dose algebra. So they would be scheduled into two back-to-back -back periods of algebra one instruction. And so for kids who get assigned to treatment here, they get tutoring instead of that second period of algebra one instruction. Okay, so that's the counterfactual for the ninth grade kids. For the 10th grade kids, an elective would be the typical class that would get crowded out by um, usually a non-academic elective um, would get crowded out by math instruction. And so the counterfactuals are very different. It turns out that the effects wind up not being so different for the ninth and 10th grade kids which tells you something itself about sort of the value added of that second period of the algebra one for the, for the ninth grade kids. Okay, um, because it's a randomized experiment, uh, the research design is uh, very straightforward and something that I think everybody on the Zoom slash YouTube has probably seen a million times before. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time uh, going through this. We're gonna basically uh, show you first uh, intent to treat estimates that compare the effects of all the kids offered uh, uh, high dosage tutoring versus all the kids randomly assigned to controls. We randomized at the school by grade level, so we're going to condition on randomization blocks. Um, and then we're going to also do the standard thing that everybody does is we're going to use random assignment to the intervention as an instrument to show you the effects of uh, actually participating in high dosage tutoring as well, okay? And then we'll give you a sense of the relative size of that impact by showing you the control complier mean. The counterfactual outcome of the kids within the control group who would have participated in tutoring had they actually been assigned to the treatment group instead. So all of this is just very, uh, sort of very standard um, so far. We'll show you some things down the road that become a little bit less standard um, and I'll explain a little bit more what we're doing there, but I'll assume that all of this is very familiar for everybody so far. So the first thing that I will just uh, show you in the way of reassuring you, but also giving you a, a sense of the study sample is the baseline um, descriptive statistics for the study sample, all right? And so you can see, you know, something like 85% of the uh, Chicago public, 85 to 90% of the um, Chicago uh, public school system is either African American or Hispanic. And you can see that our study sample, um, this is even more true on the south and west sides of Chicago. And our study sample reflects the neighborhoods of, uh, of uh, in which the schools are coming from. You can see that the average GPA at baseline is a 2.1. You can see that, you know, something like a third of the kids uh, of the grades in the previous year for the kids had been um, Ds or Fs. So kids are uh, struggling a lot academically in the study sample. And the other thing that you can see is that uh, on average, these kids, you know, they're they're about 15 years of age on average, and um, on average, there's about a, a 0.5 arrests per uh, per kid. So about a quarter of the kids had been arrested before and they average about two arrests per kid among the arrested. So uh, lots of um, uh, educational challenges for the, uh, for the study sample and um, uh, uh, unfortunately high levels of criminal justice involvement. If you sort of think back to the Heckman curve, this is a sort of study sample that lots of people would look at and assume uh, would would be very difficult to substantially move their um, their human capital, however you would want to measure that, at at this stage. Okay. So, so one quick question. Yeah. Uh, so so were these students like were they selected on the basis of you know they were if they were if the default was double dose algebra are these kids that the district thought we're at risk of not oh great yeah algebra like like or, or is this like a like a some kind of random sample yeah it's a, it's a it's a great question so so what we did is um uh let me let me explain without intending to defend you know i think in, you could second guess what we did whatever but i'll at least for starters explain what we did we we formed a um you know a, like a a very primitive kind of um, like neat, you could think of it as like a needs index and like working very closely with CPS and Saga, we decided that kids at the deepest end of the needs distribution would not be right for this intervention. You know, these are kids with like very intensive IEPs, that sort of thing. 
And so if you think about like the bell curve distribution, the kids at the left of the distribution were not eligible. And then we sort of worked our way up from there until we hit our sample size targets. And so effectively we wind up with something like, you know, I think we've got the exact figures in the NBR working paper that was circulated, but like my ballpark's sort of sense of this is that we wind up capturing in most of these schools, something like 80% of the male ninth and 10th grade students in these schools, oh. trimming sort of what you would think of as the left-hand 10% and the right-hand 10% of the distribution. So it's very representative of the kids in the middle of the distribution. And you can see that the average test scores for our sample are nearly identical to the average test scores for the schools from which they're drawn. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so that's sort of the program population. Uh, lots of people would uh, be very skeptical historically that you could do much to substantially move academic outcomes for this population at this stage of the life course. Let's see what actually happens in the experimental data. Um, so let me show you for starters uh, the, chain, the effects on uh, math uh, test scores. So these are uh, Z-scores. Um, CPS at this time was using the sort of the explore, the ACT companies explore plan tests for ninth and 10th grade students. Uh, we're normalizing these uh, and you, let's focus on the treatment and the treated effect. You can see that uh, the effects on the kids who participate is about 0.16 standard deviations. Okay. And so like one sort of benchmark you might have there is like that's foreshadowing a little bit. That's not so different from what you see for like the Tennessee star class size reduction experiment for kids in grades K through three, All right? So that's already kind of foreshadowing the conclusion that we're going to be sort of creeping to as we go. Um, you might look at that and think, well, you know, maybe what's going on here is that the teachers are teaching narrowly to the tests. And so you can look at um, what's happening with math course grades so math GPA or math course failures, you can see that the control complier mean is about a 1.6 on a 4.0 scale. That's roughly speaking like a C minus. The treatment on the treated effect is close to a 0.6 point uh, change. So that's roughly going from like a C minus to a C plus as a way to benchmark the magnitude of the math change. Another way to sort of look at this is what's going on at the, um, for the like the most extreme negative math outcomes here, which is failure. It turns out to be weirdly and surprisingly difficult in the Chicago public school systems to make up a class when you failed it. Uh, you would think they would have every, every incentive to make that as easy as possible for kids who are interested, but it turns out to be very hard. Lots of people worry that failing these required ninth grade math classes turns out to be a key bottleneck for high school graduation. It looks like um, the number of math course failures is roughly cut in half for the kids who participate relative to control complier mean. Okay, so sizable reduction in, um, in math course failures. Another thing that we were interested in here is, you know, if you can help kids do better in math, do you see spillovers to non-math uh, subjects, right? And that could happen for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, including the possibility that like if failing math really is a big gateway to high school graduation, maybe kids who know they're going to fail just give up across the board. One possibility is if you have more hope to actually graduate now because you're not going to fail, maybe you're more invested. There are other kind of stories that you could tell, but what the data show is that there's no statistically significant change in reading scores here. Again, this is like explore plan scores, but there are statistics statistically significant uh, changes in non-math grades and non-math course failures. So some uh, hint of a, of a spillover here outside of math from uh, this sort of very intensive math high dosage tutoring, okay? Now, the other sort of domain in which you might be interested, you know, if you, um, if you sort of think of the Perry Preschool benefit cost analysis, I think one of the things that was very surprising to lots of us with Perry was what a huge share of the benefit, uh, the, the benefit side of the ledger from Perry came from reductions in uh, a non 
educational outcome, which is crime involvement, um, that turns out to be a huge driver of uh, in any sort of benefit cost analysis. And so you can look at, we, we got arrest data from the Chicago Police Department and we linked that to, um, to the kids in the study sample. And you can see like the, the point estimates, if you know, ignore the standard errors for a moment and just focus on the point estimates, you can see the point estimates are very sizable as a share of the control complier means. Like these are very big proportional reductions. Um, from a statistical inference perspective, the uh, challenge here is that the point estimates are also large relative to the standard error. So, you know, maybe if you squint and imagined what would happen if you had a sample size 10 times as large, you know, maybe you could expect, or maybe you might hope that there would be some sort of spillover to this other domain that is so important uh, from society's perspective, but we just, in, in the first experiment, we're just not seeing anything that looks like statistical evidence for that. So, you know, given that we've all seen the Heckman curve over and over again, this was a surprising uh, first set of experimental uh, estimates. And so we were surprised. We um, wanted to know, is this replicable? So are those results real or are they a fluke? And, and also, you know, social policy, if I were going to describe the dominant pattern in social uh policy program evaluation, it would be really encouraging evidence at small scale that winds up not replicating. Uh, maybe you would say that's part of the replication crisis in social science more generally, I don't know. But um, so we wanted to see if this could be replicated. And so we did another experiment uh, a couple of years later in a similar set of schools, uh, as you can see here, um, similar sample size, about 2,700 kids total randomized. And now we're including um, female students in the sample as well. You can see that now, you know, just under a third of this study sample is, uh, is female. And you can see in terms of their baseline characteristics, they look similar in many ways, or in most ways, uh, qualitatively similar to the, the first RCT study sample. And, and then you can see that, you know, the usual sort of statistical inference on the baseline characteristics of the sample confirmed that randomization was done correctly. So what do you see? when you redo the whole experiment from scratch with a totally different set of kids. Well, what you see in that case is, you know, remember that the treatment on the treated effect for test scores in the first experiment was 0.16 standard deviations. The treatment on the treated effect for test scores in the second experiment is more than twice as big. It's uh, about 0.37 standard deviations gain in test scores here. And again, you can see sort of, um, sizable gains in math GPA and math course failures as well. You can see some signs of a spillover, hints of a spillover to non-math course failures. And if you look at arrests, you can see qualitatively similar patterns here of large negative point estimates for arrests, especially for things like violent, uh, violent crime arrests. They're large as a share of the control complier mean, but um, not quite statistically significant. So. You know, to a first approximation, the results that we saw in the first experiment uh, carry over very consistently to what we see in the second experiment as well. Okay, so that itself, you know, if, if this was your kid in high school on the south or west side of Chicago, you would look at this and start to say, this feels like a pretty encouraging message. Lots of people had given up on the idea that you could substantially boost uh, where high school kids are academically in places like the south and west sides of Chicago. And here, these are really big policy gains. Um, so that's sort of encouraging uh, conclusion number one. Um, OK, so now the second thing that you might want to know is do these effects persist? And so to do that, we're going to pool the study samples so we've got more statistical power to look down the road. But before I show you those results, let me just show you the short term impacts for the pooled study. So. If you pool RCT1 and RCT2, the average, just look at the math scaled impact for starters, the average treatment on the treated effect is about a quarter of a standard deviation, okay? So now what happens when you look down the road, these kids are getting the intervention in ninth or 10th grade, what happens if you look down the road to what's going on in say 11th grade and you can see that the test score impact for these kids persists through 11th grade with remarkably little sort of fade up. It's, you know, roughly a quarter of a standard deviation when you look one or two years down the road as well. So that's also really encouraging. Now, the one other outcome that you might be interested in here, um, especially through like a um, 
like a long-term life outcomes or well-being lens is what happens with high school graduation. And so like one thing that we can do is we can sort of calibrate how large of a graduation impact we might expect from test score changes of this, of this size by running a little regr a non-experimental regression of test scores against graduation not experimentally and you would expect the test score change on this size to boost graduation rates by you know uh, not more than like a handful of uh, percentage points okay and so when we look at actual changes in high school graduation you can measure this in different ways graduated on time or ever graduated like if you look at graduated on time it's a positive two percentage point gain that's not statistically significant like this winds up falling very comfortably within the confidence interval of what we would expect from a test score change of this. So it seems like we're just underpowered to be able to, even with, I mean, it's really quite striking, even with 5,000 kids, it looks like we might be a little underpowered to detect changes in an outcome like high school graduation. Hey, Jens, how about like for math GPA? So like if I, if I did that same exercise with math GPA instead of SAT, uh, uh, um, or I mean math test score, like if I just say, because you'd, you'd think high school graduation would be more sensitive to GPA, and still it's sort of surprising. Yeah, it's it's, it's a little it's a little bit it's a little bit bigger, but I think the other thing to sort of see is like look at the look at the size of the the standard error on this estimate. Yeah. Right, and so like. You know, this allows, so, you know, this 95% confidence interval here includes anything from like a nine percentage point increase to a few percentage points decrease. It's just a very wide confidence interval. And so if you do that forecasting exercise with test scores or GPA, you wind up getting point estimates that sort of fall in that very wide range. Unfortunately, I, we would just absolutely, you know, we're in the middle of doing sort of building on this work, doing a much, much, much bigger RCT in multiple school districts where I hope we'll be powered to detect long-term impacts on graduation. But in this study, we're just unfortunately underpowered. I mean, I wonder if this is a story about like your help, you have more precision in estimating the impacts on test scores because you have a baseline control for, for a you know, test score, but for other outcomes like, you know, high school graduation, whatever, where, where you can still control for test scores, they're just going to be less predictive of the outcome. We just have less power to detect. I, I, I don't know. Like, so if you put these, if you put everything in terms of standard deviation units, like would, would, would you say, okay, like our, our, we've got just a ton more power for estimating math test score impact. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a great, that's a great idea. We should, we should do that. We should, um, it is a little bit, you know, for, for, for the reason I think implicit in your question, you know, you don't normally intuitively think of, you know, an outcome like high school graduation, for instance, in z-score terms, but that's an interesting way to think about. That's a good, that's a good idea. That's a very good idea. Um, we'll definitely do that. But so, you know, uh, encouraging signs of persistence in some of the outcomes, um, you know, unfortunately, we just don't, you know, can't say very much about what's going on with high school graduation in these data. Okay. So let me turn a little bit to then sort of think a little bit more about the, about the magnitudes. And so here are the, the treatment on the treated test scores in, um, in study one and study two in standard deviation units on the y-axis. One sort of benchmark that you might have is like how much high school students normally progress over a year of school. And so if you use like Sean Reardon's, I, I realize this is, you know, I'm a little sheepish saying this to the Harvard GSE audience. This is like a very complicated thing to think about measuring. But if you sort of don't squint too hard at the details and you use some of these off the shelf estimates for, for that quantity, you know, I, I see estimates on the order of like 0.2 standard deviations is what people often point to. And so, like one sort of rough and ready way to think about this is like the delta from the intervention is like one or two times that estimated annual gain for students. So just to say it's big, right? It's big. 
Another way that you could sort of think about the, the magnitude of these treatment on the treated effects is in relation to the standardized black-white test score gap that you see among eighth graders in national data for the NAEP, and that's about 0.8 standard deviations. So you can see that one year of high dosage tutoring does a decent job of chipping away, not eliminating, but chip, helping chip away at that black-white test score gap. That's another way to, um, to think about the magnitude. So this seems, you know, I'll, I'll I'll show you a third way later in a, through a sort of a benefit cost lens, but this starts to give you some initial sense of how to think about the magnitudes. Um, you know, some other things that you're probably worrying about here is, you know, we're testing a lot of hypotheses and surely the p-values aren't right. And, and no, they're not. It would be ridiculous to take the p-values seriously as if, that, as if each row in each table was the only test we were doing. So we you know, in the paper, I'll spare you from the details. In the paper, we do a, uh, some multiple testing corrections using the false discovery rate correction that I think has become sort of standard in the program evaluation world. And, um, you know, the art, not the science here, comes in dividing outcomes up into families. And so we divided them into these four families, math outcomes, non-math outcomes, school behavior, and out-of-school behavior. And if you're happy or at least somewhat comfortable with that division of outcomes in the families, then the conclusion is all of the math impacts we've shown you have FDRQ values below 0.05, where the FDRQ value is the share of statistically significant impacts that turn out to be false positives. Um, but uh, none of the outcomes outside of math wind up surviving uh, a multiple testing correction. Okay, so we're on more solid ground concluding that the high dosage math tutoring intervention improves math outcomes than non-math outcomes. That would be the, the punchline to this. Um, you know, I mentioned already teaching to the test, you know, uh, you would be concerned, you might be concerned that the saga tutors are just teaching to what the district assesses. I showed you that some partial reassurance is that there's a change in math grades, but you still might be worried the Saga tutors are, tutors are talking to the CPS math teachers. And so maybe they're still slanting what they're doing towards what's taught in school um, and not generating broad-based math. And so one of the things that we did is we did our own in-person data collection with the study sample. Um, neither the tutors nor the students knew this was coming, much less the, the content of the tests. We used uh, the NELS 88, math tests here to assess math uh, learning. And you see test score impacts that are, if anything, slightly larger than what you see with the CPS tests. So it doesn't look like there was teaching to the test or the classroom assessments um, by the Saga tutors. Okay, so that seems encouraging. Um, you know, maybe one of the, I'll just quickly walk through what we can say about mechanisms um, and then, you know, how I think about the results here and then I'll stop and we'll hopefully have plenty of time for, for open Q&A then. And so in many ways, like one of the most interesting questions here, like, again, if it were your kid, you'd be, I think you'd be very excited about these results so far. Um, you know, from a policy perspective, I think the other thing that we're really interested in is, you um, trying to think about what it is that's driving these results as a way to help inform policy design. Um, and so, you know, for starters, you might wonder, like, is this an educational intervention or is it a, you know, a, like a non-educational intervention, like a mentoring intervention? So one thing that tutoring effectively does is it put, puts kids in intensive contact with another pro-social adult in their life who cares about them, which is essentially what a mentoring intervention is. And so to see if that mechanism is at play, we, uh, when we did our original uh, data collection with the kids, we asked some survey questions about how many adults do you have in your life to talk to? How many adults do you think um, care about you? And questions like that. Um, and there are no detectable impacts on those measures. So to the extent to which you think we can measure a, a mentoring channel through those sorts of questions, we don't seem to see any evidence of that in our survey data, okay? Um, the other thing that you might think is that the intervention might operate through a social, emotional, or uh, non-cognitive, whatever you would want to call it, um, pathway instead, right? So that the, the tutoring is actually developing non-academic skills that are generating the, the academic test score benefit. Maybe the kids now just work harder on the test and, and work harder in school. And that's why 
you know, grades and, and test scores are increasing. And so when we do our in-person data collection, we're measuring outcomes like grit and conscientiousness and locus of control. And you don't see any detectable impacts on those outcomes. And then a third sort of pathway that you might think of for this is, um, is it a change your friend's intervention? Essentially anything that changes a kid's um, peer group during the school day, including changing their course schedule relative to what it would have been, in principle could change the social network for the kid. And so we asked a bunch of questions on our surveys about how many friends you have and the attitudes of, the, of your friends towards school and different pro-social and anti-social um, uh, behaviors. And we don't see any detectable impacts on those things. Okay, so it doesn't, to the extent to which we can measure mechanisms, it doesn't seem to be um, anything in our data that is uh, falling into those three categories of, of uh, mechanisms. A different way that you could sort of think about this is, is it operating through uh, making classroom management easier? Okay, and so um, one way to test this is that the schools in our sample wind up varying a lot with respect to the level of baseline disruption that we have, we can, which we can measure either with CPS disciplinary um, measures or with arrest data on the kids attending those schools. So two different ways to think about measuring how disruptive the baseline um, classroom environments would be. And the intuition here is if the channel for match tutoring is operating by simplifying classroom management, um, then you would expect to see the biggest match tutoring impact in the schools with the highest level of baseline disruption, if that makes sense. So we can test that by interacting treatment assignment with measures of baseline levels of disruption in the school. And when you do that, you know, you can look at the interaction here and there's no statistically significant evidence that baseline disruption levels in the school are moderating the, the treatment intervention. Okay, so again, you know, the standard errors are not trivial around these interactions. And so that's a possible sort of pathway, but to the extent to which we can tell in the data that doesn't seem like it is um, uh, a detectable mechanism. And so that leaves us with personalized instruction, you know, tutoring as a way to personalize instruction relative to what you get in your counterfactual 30 kids in a classroom condition. And this raises, I think, you know, the sort of the last scientific result thing that I'll, I'll leave you with and then I'll, I'll conclude and we'll open it up is um, sort of an interesting measurement question here uh, or measurement conundrum, which um, has, has the following sort of structure, which is if you think about the logic of personalized instruction, what that logic would predict is that the kids furthest behind grade level would be the ones where you would expect the benefits of personalization to be most pronounced because they're the ones for whom regular classroom level of in instruction is most distant from, from what they're able to, to do and, and what they need, okay? But from a measurement perspective, those are the kids who are also at highest risk for floor effects in the data. Uh, sorry, floor effects in the assessments, if that makes sense, right? And so, you know, I think most people on this Zoom are probably very familiar with the logic of floor effects, but just, um, you know, just to review this, uh, uh, just in case, you know, imagine, you know, here's the floor effect concern. Imagine that you have a kid who starts off in a third grade math, uh, at a third grade math level and tutoring boosts their math skills by four grade equivalents. But suppose that the math test didn't include any items below a ninth grade level. Right. In that case, the kid would get a zero on the test, set aside random guessing. The kid would bottom out on the test, regardless of whether they got the intervention. Okay. Now, this is a cartoon version that the test makers understand the floor effect problem, of course. And so they try and hedge against this, but we're worried that we might still be suffering from, um, from floor effects concealing the, um, uh, the benefits to the kids who are furthest behind. So one partial solution when we administered our own tests, you know, we supplement the Nell's uh, test, we used the eighth grade math test. We supplemented that with some items from the Eccles fifth grade math test, right? So that gives us partial protection against the floor effect. Um, but then the other thing we did was a, uh, a partial solution here, or at least a diagnostic about what's going on is we, um, 
use these new machine learning meth methods that people like Susan Athey at Stanford have been developing that you know, machine learning tools are normally used to predict the levels of some, some variable. And Susan and Guido Imbens and uh, you know, other people have been trying to think about how to repurpose these machine learning prediction tools to predict not the level of an outcome, but a treatment response. So that you can start to estimate essentially personalized treatment responses to causal interventions, okay? And these, you know, to the extent to which these have not been as helpful as, as most social scientists have hoped, I think it's because these turn out to be very, very data intensive procedures, right? And so most people tend to do these things and, um, and they're not, uh, they're, they tend to be underpowered. And so, you know, I'll skip over some of the details in the interest of time, but I would, you know, I would, the, just the quick thing that I would say is there are diagnostic tests to tell uh, that begin to help you tell whether you are fitting true structure in nature with these methods or just fitting noise, which I think have not sufficiently socialized throughout the practitioner community yet. So lots of people use these tools, but aren't doing the diagnostics to see if they're just picking up noise or not. When we do that with our data, it looks like we can uh, say something about the structure of heterogeneous treatment effects more for math than outside of math, okay? And so I'm gonna focus on just showing you heterogeneous treatment effect estimates for math. But I would say even with a pooled sample size of 5,000 kids in this RCT, you know, even here, you should be worried about whether we have adequate power to do this for math, right? And 5,000 kids in an RCT, this is a relatively, you know, we have nudge interventions with like zero cost, uh, treatments where you have hundreds of thousands of kids, right? But if you think about social science experiments where the intervention has a non-trivial cost associated with it, we don't have lots and lots of examples of those that have lots more than 5,000 kids. So this gives you a sense for exactly how data intensive these machine learning methods are. Okay, with all of that as like, let me just skip over this. Um, okay. So here's sort of the first heterogeneous treatment effect estimate that I want to, uh, to show you. So we can take all, this is for math test scores, and we can rank all the kids in our study by their estimated math treatment effect, and then we can calculate the average personalized treatment effect by quartile. And if you think that we're actually fitting some structure here rather than noise, you can see that you would conclude here that there's an enormous difference between the kids who are benefiting the most for whom, um, you know, the average impact, these are ITT results, right? So the average ITT effect here at the top end of the distribution is 0.2. And for the bottom quartile, it's like close to zero. So enormous differences, okay? The other thing that you can see here that's a little bit surprising with our theory about who should benefit the most from personalization is the kids who are benefiting the least are the kids who are furthest behind at baseline, okay? So either our personalization theory is wrong or the test scores that we're using to measure impacts are suffering from floor effects that are masking the benefits for the kids at the bottom here. Now, it's a little bit hard for us to perfectly uh, disentangle those two candidate explanations, but one thing that we can do is we can think about plotting kids now, not in a one-dimensional, personalized treatment effect on an outcome space, but in a two-dimensional space. So we can estimate heterogeneous treatment effects for different outcome, for two different outcomes and plot kids uh, in that two-dimensional space and even do some clustering to see if there are groups of kids that stand out in that, in that treatment response um, space. And this is what that looks like when you do it with math GPA on the y-axis and math test scores on the x-axis. Now, it's a little bit misleading. I'm showing you the point estimates for the kids, not you know implicitly here. There's a 95% confidence interval for every kid's location in this two-dimensional space. So there's really like a, a circle, not a point here. But to make the graph sort of easy to see and interpret, I'm just showing you the points. And I think the relevant thing that I want to show you here is notice on the y-axis here for math GPA, almost all the kids are showing a positive math GPA gain. Okay. But in contrast, you can see like this is the zero 
treatment effect gain on math test scores. You can see there's a large share of kids who are showing positive treatment effects on math GPA, but negative impacts, you know, zero or negative impacts on math test scores. Now that, that's not smoking gun evidence of floor effects, but that is the type of pattern that you would expect to see here in a world in which there are floor effects. Okay, now the problem that we have is we can't instead look at like math GPA, or I don't think that we can use math GPA to figure out who's benefiting the most because like who knows how to think about, you know, if I have a 0.5 GPA gain going from 0.15 to two, how do I think about whether that's a bigger or smaller gain than going from like three to 3.5 on the GPA scale, right? It's just, we don't think of GPAs as being designed to give us comparable learning unit changes at different parts. It's hard enough for test scores to do that, which are aspiring to do that. GPA isn't even aspiring to do that. So, so here's what we did instead. Um, we capitalized on the fact that our test scores we, that we administered, we have item level data. We can rank all those items by difficulty, by the share of kids who get them right. We can divide kids up by whether they're above or low, below the baseline test, uh, test median in our sample. And we can plot their intent to treat effect on items by difficulty. And so these are the kids who are below median at baseline. You can see they experience the largest gains for the relatively easiest measure. These are the kids who are above median at baseline. And visually, it looks like they're benefiting the most from the items that are hardest for our study sample. Now, the confidence intervals here are really big, so I wouldn't want to make too much of this, but at least visually, this is like suggestive evidence that personalization could be part of it. Okay, so this is just to say the usual lament from doing an experiment is it's easier to document the average effects than understand why that's, uh, why that's happening. So this is at best suggest suggestive. So let me just close with my final slide. I can see Tom looking at the clock. I'm looking at the clock <laughs> as well. Um, I think there are two ways to read this paper. One is it's a scalable, you know, a scalable $3,000 per kid intervention that substantially boosts math learning. Um, and, you know, I think the next question that we're really thinking a lot about is, um, uh, is the way to lower cost. And if human interaction is not a key part of this, if it turns out that it's personalization, that's the key part, how far can you go to use things like computer assisted learning as a complement or substitute to expensive human tutoring to lower the marginal cost to make this more scalable, okay? Now, the other way that I would sort of think about this is with respect to the broader Heckman curve question about whether it's too late to substantially improve kids' ac academic outcomes once they reach adolescence. And so the other thing that we can do is calculate a benefit cost ratio for this intervention for this study sample. And if I plot that on the so-called Heckman curve, this is basically where it falls. It's clearly very off the curve and very inconsistent with the idea that it really is too late to substantially help kids once they reach adolescence. And so I think in many ways, that's sort of the deeper point that comes out of this paper, which is how do we think about the potential for uh, human development at different stages of the, of the life course? Um, I think to a Harvard GSE audience, you, you were probably looking at the Heckman curve and starting initially skeptical of that view, but that view has been very influential in lots of circles for a long time. And I think the results that we're seeing here suggest instead, maybe we just have been trying policy levers that haven't been solving some of the uniquely challenging challenges of, uh, of working with adolescents. So uh, thanks for your time. Let me stop there. I think we've got some time for, for Q&A left. Thank you. Great. So. Thanks, uh, Jens. Um, I would just encourage people, if you have questions, to raise your hand. I, I see we, we have a few, and I'll, I'll try to go in order uh, that people raised hands. So, um, uh, uh, Chris, Chris Cleveland. I'll go. I, mean, I think Peter can go next because uh, he had his hand up. Was but oh, thank okay, you for, sorry, for the right. presentation. Um, one question I had about the 
framing of like potential next steps um, that you outlined around like personalization or like remote instruction. Um, in the paper, I think it's noted that study one, uh, the treatment replaced a second math period, whereas in study two, the treatment replace an elective period, but that students like maintain the double dose math period. And the treatment, the study too has like a larger like effect size for the um, treatment. And like, so like looking at those two comparisons, like wouldn't that suggest that replacing math instruction provided by a teacher with a tutor is like less efficacious than just adding on additional tutoring to teacher provided math instruction or oh, there an alternative like interpretation that we should have from those two studies? Yeah, I mean, I think that the way, the way that I think about, it's a great question. Um, it, it's a great question. And I, I think the way that I think about, about um, sort of understanding the implications through that lens is, is really focused. I think that the cleanest sort of comparison there is the impacts on the ninth versus the 10th graders. Because it's the ninth graders where the counterfactual is the double dose algebra and the 10th graders where the counterfactual is some non-math, typically a non-math elective. And when we compare the impact for ninth versus 10th graders, it's buried in one of like the 50 appendix tables. Um, when we do that, the impacts look very similar for ninth versus 10th graders. And so I think like, it's not exactly a it, it's not exactly like the, the cleanest test because there if there's age heterogeneity and response to intervention, we're sort of confounding that. But if you set aside for the moment age heterogeneity and the response, what you might be tempted to conclude there is maybe the double dose of algebra, like 30 kids in a classroom for an hour and a half instead of 45 minutes, like the extra 45 minutes of that is not doing all that much good would be one one possible interpretation. Thank you. Peter, I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong screen to yeah. see uh, yeah. to, to consider order. So I'm no sorry, problem. but I'm glad we got to you. Yeah, Jens, thank you so much for a really terrific talk. I, I want to build on Chris's question. And in terms of interpretation, what stands out to me is like, would you suggest that we think about extending this intervention to other subjects? Because one of the things that you showed was that there was fade out for the English and for the non-math subjects. And then also there wasn't an impact on graduation. So the, the two parts of my question are, given that we, we don't see an impact on graduation rates, is the theory of change that we expect that boosting someone's math skills is going to have long-term impacts, even if there's no impact on graduation? And so therefore we should be just content to focus on math, or should we be thinking about should we be thinking about this kind of like personalized instruction as a technological shift that we should broaden to all subjects as a way of boosting graduation rates and college going? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, you know, when when I when I um, when I read experimental results, I I look at I look at results without asterisks through the lens of is this a noisy zero or a precisely estimated zero? And I would view our graduation impact as a imprecisely estimated zero, which is the most frustrating sort of estimate that you can that you can get in, in some ways. But like I I think it would be it would be premature to conclude that it doesn't necessarily increase high school graduation. I would want to see I would want to see a precisely estimated zero from a larger RCT before I I affirmatively drew that conclusion. But I think that sort of the larger question, you know, we Based on sort of the, the results of the first RCT, we spent a lot of time talking to CPS and they, their thinking went exactly in the direction that, that you went in, which is um, what does this imply for other grades and other subjects and how should we think about that? And their next highest priority was, this was around the time where the city was making a big push to try and ensure that every kid leaving third grade was literate. And so they prioritized the literacy tutoring intervention for third graders, and the results there look very encouraging uh, as well. We, you know, we've only done that a couple of years ago, so we have we can't look at the effects of that on graduation, obviously. But um, you know, this sort of persistence and subject area and grade is one of the key questions that we're talking. Where where do you get the most social good per dollar spent? Is is very high on our research agenda. 
And just a very quick follow-up, some as a suggestion, one thing that you might want to do is to look at what factors predict whether somebody is going to commit crime. Because it could be the case that the limiting factor for graduation is really the commission of crime. And so, so even if you're moving the GPA, but you're not moving the probability of like committing crimes, then you could still have a suppression of the graduation rate. So if there's some way to kind of like separate out folks who are gonna have a higher propensity to commit crime versus not, and focus on the folks who have a lower propensity to commit crime, then maybe you'd actually see a lot of heterogeneity within the graduation impacts. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, masking. it's a great, it's a, it's a great, it's a great point that we probably should have thought of before before now, but you know, I'm I'm embarrassed that we didn't think about it before, but it's a great suggestion. Thank you. And it's particularly important because Joe Doyle and Anna Iser have a wonderful paper showing that detention in the Cook County juvenile detention system has very big negative adverse impacts on high school graduation rates. And so that that is like a very clear, obvious pathway through which, you know, what what you're describing could happen. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Eric. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jens. Um, so I was uh, thinking about trying to think about mechanisms that might operate that might operate through the classroom teacher. Because if I am, if I'm understanding correctly, the tutors were in the classrooms with the students while they were having their sort of main instruction. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, sorry. The the, the tutor. It was a it was a separate it was a separate um, it was a separate class scheduled into the kids. Uh, schedule and they're in a separate room. So you walk into the room and there are little pairs of desks yes. where there's actually like a trifecta of desks where it's like a tutor and then two students and then some saga supervisor walking around. So oh. they're f physically separated from the classroom, but it is true that the tutors do interact with the classroom instructors. Teachers. Yeah. Right. Right, so um, so maybe less scope, but I, I'm still wondering about like whether sort of teachers who are more effective in other ways are either better at supporting the tutors through whatever interactions they have directly with the tutors, or better at um, or better at understanding and uh, how the tutors are affecting their students and sort of changing their behavior in ways that uh, are complementary with the tutoring intervention. Yeah, it's great. I mean, if I can say back what I think the operational implication of your of your idea, let me tell me if this is what you have in mind. Yeah. It's like you can imagine estimating um, you can imagine estimating like teacher value teacher value added measures for the counterfactual teachers, and then thinking about whether there's some way of figuring out whether teacher value added is like a in the control condition, you know. Well, the teacher value added in the main classroom condition is a complement or substitute for the tutoring, something like that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah there's the great. substitute part where they're leaving some other, other classroom that they would have had, and it's interesting there. But it's also interesting in sort of whether the whether there's something about being the classroom teacher um, that is part of the positive treatment effect. Yeah, and, you know, and, and like, it, it's also possible that like if the tutoring makes you, if the tutoring enhances your capacity to engage with regular grade level classroom instruction, that's only going to be helpful if my teacher is actually teaching something. Right. right. So yeah, that's great. Thank you, Eric. I mean, even just following up on that quickly is like, if you know who the alternative math teacher is, even just like doing it as if it were like a site by site you know, impact, like, like, are, are there some teachers for whom being assigned to the, to the treatment has a huge impact, like that could either reflect the fact that they're particularly weak, or, you know, that they're strong, and you could then try to explore whether you could predict those site impacts by, with the prior, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. great, great, great. So uh, Elizabeth Setron from Tufts, Hi, I um, really enjoyed the talk. Um, in your other work about scale up, uh, you talk about like, um, I guess just in this context, I'm wondering as you're working on RCTs that are at a bigger scale, are you planning on incorporating um, kind of what, as you know, like how previous RCTs don't succeed at scale? Like, and are you, do you have a way to kind of study and analyze that kind of, or are you going to, kind of throw all of the components that you think will 
be required to make it successful? Or will you be able to kind of test which components may matter for success at scale? Yeah, I mean, what, one of the things that we thank you for the uh, thank you for the kind words about the doc and, and coming and for the for the question. It's uh, um, w- one of the things that we're trying to wrap up right now is, you know, w- what we there's a little bit of, like if you think about scaling a program, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg, right? Or I can never I, I can let me confess that I can never keep straight the distinction between chi- what what's a chicken and egg problem and what's a catch twenty two problem. So let me describe the problem and then you can put it into into the right category. So, the, you know, we only want to scale programs that will actually work at large scale. The only way we can find out if a program works at large scale is to scale it. I don't know if that's a catch twenty two or a chicken and egg, but it's a problem either way, right? And so. What we've, what we've done with Saga is we, we're finishing up the analysis now of an experiment where we raised some extra money and we got Saga to um, interview, like recruit way more. Oh, Peter's saying chicken and egg. Thank you, Peter. We should put it up to a vote, I guess. That would be the... Uh, so we, we got Saga to recruit way more um, tutors than they normally would, tutor applicants than they normally would. And... Um, rank order lots more than they would normally uh, hire. And then we got them to do some hiring further down. Like we, we basically like randomly sampled tutors at different parts of the Saga tutor ranking distribution beyond what you would normally see at small scale and getting closer and closer to the sort of tutors that you would get if you increase the scale by a factor of like five or 10, because normally, you know, we, you test the program. So it's tutor quality fade off. That's probably one big potential driver of problems at scale. And you only see that we, you know, we can see within the, the range of variation at small scale, the tutors are all great, but what happens if I increase scale five or 10? And so this gives us a way to get a glimpse of what would happen to tutor quality if you increased scale by a factor of five or 10, without actually having to operate the program at a scale of five or 10, right? And so I think that, you know, that it might be an obvious insight, I don't know, but it's the sort of thing where like, as social scientists start to think more and more seriously about actually helping solve problems at large scale, we're gonna have to contribute tricks and ideas like that to be able to understand like impacts at large scale without the brute force you know, it was hard enough for us to raise the money to randomize 5,000 kids. How in the world are you going to do it with 50,000 kids? It's just really, really hard. So I think we have to substitute cleverness for, for money in solving that sort of scale challenge. So, so as you described, Jens, like the, the, the saga tutoring grew out of Match Charter School. Yep. And Match Charter School used the tutoring program as a way to spot... Um, promising, you know, young teachers. Um, And, you know, so they would use tutoring as a way to sort of, you know, screen out, you know, you know, and or identify folks who could be effective in a regular classroom. So I wonder if you could even get like Chicago to test that if they're going to do a big scale up of tutoring, say, okay, why don't we take some of your beginning teachers, run them through the tutoring, and then see whether their effects during the tutoring, you know, are predictive of their effectiveness in, in a classroom. Like oh, it, great. It becomes like a, 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 a lower cost way to really try to identify most effective teachers before they're in the classroom. Great. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. So, okay. So um, uh, I just wanted to Thank Jens for 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 joining us uh, today. Um, I guess you know we can do like a little clap clap. Um, normally, this is the time when I um, I say, and next week we've got so and so, but I'm I don't know who the next person is because we don't have next uh, fall schedule yet. Um, but uh, anyway, we're, we were thrilled to have such a. Uh, uh, a, a great uh, year and 
uh, lucky to have so many of you here, but also to close it out on such a high note with, with uh, Jens today. So um, thanks everybody. I, I, I hope we'll be reconvening many of us in person in, in the fall. Uh, and, uh, uh, but would love to have Jens back uh, in person uh, at, at some point if we could get him. Thanks so much, everybody, for having me. I'd, I'd love to come and see everyone in person once we can. Thank you very much.